this to be recorded. Hi, Chris. All right. So I think we should get started. Uh, my name is Sara, as you all know. I'm the Water Quality Program Manager with PEP. And we have, uh, I guess, a light agenda for today, at least compared to other meetings. So we might be able to end a little bit earlier than expected. Um, let's do a quick uh, whoop, checklist of who do we have here. All right, so I have Valerie, our outreach coordinator from PEP, Professor Chris Gobler from Stony Brook. Sorry, I got you a bad time right now. Hi, Chris. Uh, we have Chris Clapp. Uh, used to be TNC, right? Now it's, it's oh, your music. Yeah, now I'm with, with the Ocean Sewage Alliance, but also just here as Chris Clapp, who lives in Morris here. <laughs> All right. We have Beth Lamorux from Q&A uh, from Anchor. Yeah, that she's going to be presenting on our nitrogen load reduction tool. Shona from the DC Marine. Nancy Pearson from uh, Suffolk County Department of Health. Anthony Canino from Suffolk County. Uh, Jess, uh, Joyce. I think is Sauer from Suffolk County Department of Health. And we have someone joining over the phone with a phone number that ends in 038. All right. So I guess we can start. So the first item on our agenda is the results of the water quality data from 2022 that we do here at PEP. Uh, yes, a reminder, these are the stations from where we're getting data. The analysis divides the bay into four segments. Those segments were updated last year with this committee. So now we have two Western segments, 1A, 1B. 1A is the river influence and 1B is just west. Uh, then we have the central segment, number two, and then the eastern segment, number three. The yellow circles are as the Suffolk County Department of Health Services water quality stations. From this, we get our chlorophyll data, the total nitrogen and the secchi disk data. The stars are the Suffolk County Department of Health Services beach sampling from here, we get our pathogen data, enterococcus. And then the green triangles are the USGS continuous water quality monitoring stations. Uh, from last year, so active last year, we have um, <clears throat> the Riverhead Station, uh, the, well, I'm blanking out, <laughs> the Eastern Station, uh, we added a new one in Shelter Island. It started being active for recording data towards the end of the year. So we're not using the year, that data for the 2022 report, but we will incorporate data from this third station in our next report for the 2023 year. So that's good to have right a better gradient within the bay. So for chlorophyll A, these, uh, these are the results, nothing surprising, always looking worse on the Western side. The worst offender is Reefs Bay with 13.6 micrograms per liter. And actually, I think I have a better way to look at this because these maps are usually kind of tricky. I have this interactive version. Here you have all our stations. Are you all seeing now the, the new version? I'm not sure. If hopefully transition properly. Have you seen the map moving? Yes. Thank you, <laughs> appreciate that. So as I was saying, uh, here Reeves, uh, right? The worst offender, the Western in general looking worse than the central and Eastern segments. Remember the threshold 
for chlorophyll is 5.5 microliters, uh, micrograms per liter. So all these stations here are above the desired threshold, right? And again, be cautious with looking at this data. As you can see, most of these stations really don't go deep into the embayments. We mentioned, we talked about that in previous years, right? So the tidal cycle, the time of the day, all this is going to affect some of these values. So usually caution is you know, recommended with the Eastern and Central segments because things tend to look better than what they really are. All right, um, let me go back. Next we have water clarity. This one looks a little bit worse than last year. We have here the interactive map. Uh, the threshold for this one is 6.5 feet. Numbers below that are considered bad. Right? So for example, look at Risk Bay, we have three feet of median, three feet here again. Right? So the Eastern region not looking great, but even if we go to our central segment, we have consistently values either uh, below the threshold or just at the threshold. It looks like the water quality clarity last year was not great and a little bit worse than what we saw the previous year. Here is the combined. Remember for in PEP, we use this stop light uh, method to report on data with the red needs immediate action. Yellow, we need to do something about it because things are not looking great and green gets a good pass. Uh, this table here is the combined values when we look at water clarity and chlorophyll together. Nothing's changed from last year, from the previous report. So the river influence segment looking the worst. The Western and Central segment, we need to keep an eye on them. These things are right looking worse every year. And the easternmost segment so far is the good kid, right? Those are really looking good. Um, one issue that I guess I should comment is that I think probably you are all aware that Suffolk County suffered a, a cyber attack uh, last, that was already like September, October, 2022. Um, and that led to some issues also collecting this data or having the labs analyzing this data. So for especially chlorophyll and total nitrogen, our data stops in August. The last data point is in August. So results for last year, right? We need to be a little bit mindful we're looking at them, right? You can see here in the box plot, the red dots are the values for 2022 and consistent measurements end in August, right? So that's why some of the results can be a little bit wonky. This is total nitrogen, which it's looking a little bit better than last year. Um, this is Sawmill Creek, and meeting house creek of the chart, right? These values here, the scale it's, uh, ends at 0 0.45. Uh, remember the threshold suggested by EPA for, chlor uh, for total nitrogen is 0 0.4 milligrams per liter. These two stations are way past that. But compared to last year, looks like the rest of the Peconic River is doing well. I have here last year, right? So you can see. Oops, too much. A clear difference. But once again, uh, September usually is a month where we still get really high values. So missing that data point is probably skewing, right? Um, the whole data set that these median results are to look a little better than what they really are. So again, I advise caution <laughs> when using this data. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned it, but all this is available at our website. So if you want to peruse on your own time, there's more plots in there, right? I do a lot of graphs and analysis. So just click on this link underneath here, right? 
and it will take you to this page. This is from last year, I need to update this poster, but you have the stations, the tables, right? More tables, if you click down, uh, well, it gives you, well, just click on the drop down. So it's gonna show you, oh, there we go, right? All the plots and tables. And if there's something else you would like to see that is not included in the website, just talk to me and make sure you get it. All right, so let's go back to what I was. Uh, nitrogen, all right. Next is dissolve oxygen. Uh, as I mentioned before, now we have three stations. By the time the Shelter Island one started running, it was towards the end of the year. So that data is not included in this report, but it will be on the next one. Uh, for now, we have the Peconic River and Orient Harbor. As usual, Orient Harbor is in the Eastern segment. Results looking pretty nice. This is for chronic, Sorry, this is for acute low dissolved oxygen. We see that the Peconic River right, for the summer months, it's looking pretty bad. This proportion is the proportion of the month that had consecutive levels of acute low dissolved oxygen. Um, sometimes it might be confusing, but oops. There's a way, um, we can also look at just, if it's that easier for you, something that you would like to use. I also have these ones, which is the same data, it's just showing you the, the actual number of consecutive days, right? So you can do it as a number of days or the proportion within the month. So summer months for acute, looking pretty bad. Uh, July and August, practically the whole month at acute low DO levels. You can also look at chronic, which the threshold is 4.8 milligrams per liter, and then things look even worse. Um, yeah, we need to do something. Remember, uh, low DO affects, right? We can, it can lead to fish kills. Um, it's not great for scallops. So, not great in general, right? The last parameter I look at is go back to slideshow so you see bigger the pathogens the table on this side is showing you the number of instances where we have values of enterococcus and the units are colony forming units above the threshold the threshold is 104 colony forming units per every 100 milliliters of sample in 2021, we had four sites with values too high. Uh, three of them were in Shelter Island. This year, well, 2022, the numbers are much worse. We had nine sites and <clears throat> six of them are in Shelter Island. But clearly there's something going on. Last year we had, I think it was Crescent. I can look at it. Here in the table, so we have Perman Music Camp, Weights, and I think the other one was Crescent Beach, right? In Shelter Island this year, we have basically the whole North Shore of Shelter Island having instances of uh, values above the threshold, which is not great. I know that there's a very busy cove there, right? With, because of the hotel. So it looks like we need to focus our attention in this region here uh, for management and also identifying where these pathogens are coming from. Hey, Sarah. Yes, please. What's the, um, you're comparing this to the state swimming standard, is that what it is? The, these are the threshold, you mean? Yeah. Is EPA. Yeah, so it's probably DOA, so, for swimming or for shell fishing or? These are for recreation. Got it. And it's probably, yeah. So is it, what is it, 104 colonies? 104, yes. Yeah. It's in the table here. It's a little bit small, so it might be difficult to see. Yeah. Yeah, 104. 
Yeah, gotta get, I gotta mean, get if my we, glasses to do that. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. I, I have other tables, uh, so I can make these tables with any threshold you want. It's, it's pretty, now that I have the code, it's pretty easy. Yeah. So you have other numbers that you would like me to check? Out of curiosity, I'm happy to, to do it for you. I Actually, I don't know. Oops. So sometimes, right, depending if it's for consumption, these um, numbers get smaller, right? More, res more restrictive. So I do run some just for curiosity when I'm doing this analysis. Sorry, I'm pulling so many folders. So I do the threshold at 30 and at 50, and then, right, it looks a bit more gruesome at <laughs> the numbers. So, yeah. I'm going, in PEP we go by the EPA standard, but again, if anybody has other number in mind, and they would like to get this table done with the threshold, I'm more than happy to make it for you. Yeah, but I mean, for, for that's really the standard for, for bathing beaches, as Joyce pointed out. You know, there, there's wiggle room when you get to shellfish because there's a few different standards, but, you know, swimming, it's a um, it's just thumbs up or thumbs down. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And um, so... So I would just add, Chris, you know, under our strategy, we're supposed to review this every year. The bathing beach standard was originally used because um, uh, really it was a, a large data set that was easy to access. Um, I, I think that we're happy to entertain tweaking it if we could have regular, if there's something better, or if we could have regular. No, I, think, I think it's number. good, you know, just that the, the, for you know the the shell fishing standard, there's a different. So intercoccus is the standard for bathing beaches, but at least in New York, they're using fecal coliform, and there's you know so different metric and different um, thresholds. So yes. you know I mean it's intercoccus is more specific, you, and therefore um, is better. It's a it's not as general as fecal coliform, but it's just another you know it's, it's another data set. I think pretty sure so. County has fecal coliform data um, as well. Anyway, it'd just be like yet another way to look at it from you know it's the same metric that is you know indicator bacteria, but um, yeah, just good let let you refine it. And but you know sometimes it's confusing. Sometimes they all track together. Other times they don't. Um, but the shell generally the shell fishing standard, you know, the highest standard for shell fishing is very very low. I think it's like fourteen colony forming units, and so. Uh, or enterococcus. Uh, no, no, that's for because again, it's DEC and they use fecal coliform. For the fecal, yeah, okay. Yeah, I saw that data set. I, I, I had some issues. I was perusing, so I found it uh, from in the EPA repository, but it was linking to, to, the, count, uh, to the county, no, New mm -hmm. York State, I think it was. And I saw that they report fecal coliform, but I was only able to see. Like an average, but it, it was a, not user friendly. That's the point I'm making. So I I would like to be able to download the whole data set. I'm sure there's a way. I just need to you know look deeper or ask the right person. <laughs> but it's something maybe we should start considering in PEP, including the fecal coliform source. Um, so maybe I make a note here. All right, all right. So that's the end for the water quality report. Do anybody have any questions? I know I went a little fast, but as I said, all this is available online. I need to update the actual written report. And once that's done, it will get uploaded to our website and I will also distribute within the this committee. Just one comment, Sarah, and that is I think yes. you know, one further way to slice the pie here is you know there's a, obviously there's like what you could call the main stem stations right and then there's like the tributary stations and so i guess the point being that like you know the, the uh you know a main the, the main stem station all the way in the west like the middle of flanders bay or middle of great Peconic bay probably always going to have great water quality and but like even tributaries far to the east, 
sometimes can are going to you know have serious problems uh, with water quality and so and you know from a, even from like a management point of view you know looking at those separately may also make sense right because um you know you're not really uh you know they, they for example the runoff and the nutrient loads are are being most acutely felt by those you know tributaries that are surrounded by land so you know i don't i and i honestly haven't looked at the data enough to know um if you know i i guess you could even imagine a scenario where like you know, there could be a tributary, you know, far out in the North Fork that's in terrible shape. Uh, and the water quality could be better in an area far to the West because it's not as uh, developed around it. So it's just like a little nuance that could be valuable and have managerial implications. And th that kind of nuance, you know, gets washed out with the East-West transit. I mean, obviously across the main stem, it makes perfect sense to have these sections. So I, I wouldn't, I think what you have here is very valuable, but I, I, I don't even have the answer, but I think we could maybe collectively think about how, you know, how, what, what's another way to look at that tributary data uh, in regions that, again, it, that it, they won't fall out and they shouldn't necessarily fall out east, west. It's more going to be about, um, you know, the, the really no. fine sub watershed. Yeah, maybe based on depth, like. So uh, I'm just going to jump in here with two comments. One of them is um, what we're trying to get at by moving into the abatement embayments is um, kind of just that, right? And um, eventually having it at a place where we can have this report, but right, a subset of that be, and maybe that's what we talk about more, is what's happening in the embayments, right? But having the funding to go into every embayment is just not possible. So we're starting with these prior priority embayments um, and really talking about that. And we had agreed, the TAC had agreed to pause and wait and see while the county is, right? They have engaged a consultant, for some sort of monitoring about the subwatershed plan. So waiting to see what that was and where we can fit in and where it's appropriate to support that and where it's appropriate to continue with the embayments that we're looking at. So we're kind of in a little bit of a pause to see what the county, and I think they're starting, right? With They have a group together. So um, I don't know if Joy is on this call and can speak to where the, the county's at status is. Um, apologies, I was a little late, or Anthony. Um, and yeah. I, I missed introductions, but I, I think that's, we were kind of waiting to see what happens there. Yeah, Joyce, we have um, we have the consultant CDM on board um, and we've started uh, into this Tuesday actually coming up. Uh, most of you, I imagine, have invites to um, monitoring plan technical committee that we have uh, planned. And um, we're going to introduce CDM and uh, discuss what they're going to do over the next year uh, to come up with a, a monitoring plan for the entire county. For the subwatershed wastewater plan, so um, definitely want to input on on monitoring needs, um, and as well, you know, we want to use all the existing information that we can and uh, look into what monitoring needs remain. And see what we can do. Thanks, Anthony, for the update. Yeah, I mean, so uh, you know, waiting for that. And I know you're going to talk a little bit about your work and some of the embayments, Chris, but really leaning into, as part of this embayment work, looking at the HABs, right? So as part of that HAB strategy that was done, I don't know, 2017 or 18, um, and using that as sort of a piece of the monitoring puzzle as well. All right, so that actually is a good segue for Chris. <laughs> uh, the next presentation is going to be Chris talking about his work in uh, determining nitrogen reductions needed to mitigate HAPS in the Peconic estuary. Uh, let me stop sharing this and make sure you can share your screen. And the floor is yours. Okay. Thanks, Sarah. Hope everybody's doing well. 
this afternoon. I almost said this morning, but I guess we're now in the afternoon. Um, let's see here. Okay. Yeah, so this is a report on an ongoing project. We started it just about not quite a year ago, and we're in the thick of it uh, right now, as for reasons you'll see um, momentarily. So just go through a quick introduction. Of course, it's, this whole project is really about nutrient loading and how nutrient loading from land goes into sea and affects what's going on in coastal waters. We know what's happening there with regards to changes in nitrogen and where the nitrogen's coming from and what its impacts can be. Um, and you can see in the Peconic Estuary, this map from last summer, just showing you know, more than a half a dozen different HABs uh, occurring uh, all across Long Island, and I think at least three or four of them within the Peconic Estuary um, and hypoxic zones as well. On the harmful algal bloom front, uh, across New York, we generally have two different varieties, those that make biotoxins um, and those that, that are on the left and those that are what we call ecosystem disruptive uh, on the right. And there's a fair bit of data out there um, showing how higher nitrogen can intensify both the intensity, uh, density, and toxicity of these events, um, although very little of this work has been done in the Peconic Estuary. So to drill down, start getting into this project, we're focused on three types of harmful algal blooms in the Peconic Estuary. So I'll just introduce those real quick. Uh, the first is uh, HABs formed by Alexandrium. Alexandrium makes saxitoxin, which is a neurotoxin. That's a thousand times more potent than cyanide. Uh, and at high levels, it can lead to paralytic shellfish poisoning. Uh, this can be a fatal syndrome at, um, you know, very high levels and uh, you know can lead to paralysis um, at less intense uh, levels. So obviously something to be concerned with. Uh, and the organism is widespread across New York and it's been found at high densities. Uh, it's been found throughout the Peconic Estuary, firstly, uh, and at very high densities in multiple locations across the Peconic Estuary as well. Um, up until this year, we had seven different locations that have been closed. Uh, to uh, shell fishing because of uh, Alexandrian blooms and PSP and saxitoxin getting in shellfish. You can see several of these were or historically have been in the Peconic Estuary. Um, right now, for those of you who may not be aware, there's actually three separate shellfish bed closures in the Peconic Estuary due to PSP, um, and then a fourth in Shinnecock Bay. But um, earlier in the month, uh, there was a uh, closure of Meeting House Creek and Terry Creek at the eastern extent of the Peconics. Um, and then just last week, that was followed by a closure of the entire western half of Flanders Bay, uh, as well as a closure encompassing both Jockey Creek and Town Creek in the towns of Southhold. And um, I can say this is the first time that there's been a shellfish bed closure for Flanders Bay. Uh, in the history of New York State, and the first time there's been closures of Town Creek and Jockey Creek in the history of New York State. Uh, and the first two closures, uh, those in Meeting House and Terry Creek, there's, that's probably occurred um, a hand, it's occurred a handful of times. I was going to say up to five. And I think there's been about that many or more in Shinnecock Bay as well. Uh, but these are first time closures. Uh, for Flanders Bay and for Jockey and Town Creek. So uh, so this has been a pretty bad year for paralytic shellfish poisoning in general uh, and an early year. Uh, in the past, we'd say that May was the season for uh, PSP and Alexandrium, but the very warm winter we had um, has likely resulted in what we see this spring. This organism spends actually nine months of the year in sediment uh, in what's known as a cyst stage, which you can think of as a seed. And so it emerges when water temperatures get warm enough. And so I believe my the hypothesis would be that the warmer winter allowed this organism to flourish uh, earlier in the year. On the nitrogen front, just very quickly, we have done a study of nitrogen in this organism in Western Long Island, specifically in North Port Harbor. Um, where we've been able to show that more nitrogen 
can give in different forms, can give you more of the cells and more of the toxin. The toxin, saxitoxin is a nitrogen rich compound. Uh, so more nitrogen gives you more toxin. And that paper that I referenced, we were even able to uh, use isotope uh, fingerprinting to determine that the nitrogen in the cells was actually coming from wastewater. A second hab we're following the peconic estuary is Dinophysis acuminata. Um, it causes diuretic shellfish poisoning, and that's because it makes this compound ochidaic acid, and uh, ochidaic acid is a gastrointestinal toxin. And back to Northport and Western uh, part of Long Island, that's had had been a hot spot for these events in the past. Um, and this is just showing the levels of DSP toxins that we found within shellfish in Northport Harbor, Northport Bay, and Huntington Harbor. Um, most of these values are above the FDA limit for closing a shellfish bed. Um, and this is before New York State DEC was even um, tracking um, this toxin in this hab. And also in Northport, we had done previous work that has shown that, um, again, enrichment with nitro nitrogenous compounds like ammonium um, can increase the cell densities of uh, dinophysis. And we did, uh, in that region, 10 experiments and 9 out of 10 times ammonium. And again, a nitrogenous compound was able to increase the biomass of this organism. The final hab we're looking at in the peconic estuary is um, Cochlidinium polygricoides. Um, also known as rust tide, and also has actually undergone a name change, although uh, some of my colleagues want to change the name back. So I, I'm leaving the old name. Its new name is actually Margolephidinium polycricoides, but that's uh, even more of a mouthful. But we can just call it rust tide. Uh, it's been going on in the Peconic estuary since 2004. Um, you can see this is an organism. You, you know it's there when it's there because of the discoloration of the water. I think later on I have a picture of the cell, but these are enormous cells, so they're really hard to miss. And we know that Suffolk County was monitoring uh, waters, you know, since the Brown Tide era of 1985. So we know this really showed up out of nowhere in 2004, and has been occurring uh, every year ever since. Um, this organism is what's known as ichthyotoxic. We discovered that these pictures are from the Marine Lab in Southampton. Um, we discovered that the hard way where we had a bunch of fish in collection and overnight they just would die off. You can see the mucus on the outside of the cells from the cochlidinium, um, from the cochlidinium cells. Um, I'm sure most people, at least familiar with the East End, are familiar with the practice of pound net fishing. And, uh, you know, fishermen who undertake this practice and are doing it during blooms have reported in the nets that they accumulate the fish. They can sometimes come in the morning, see what they have, and everything is dead if a bloom sweeps through. And we've seen just experimentally that small fish uh, experience 100% mortality when exposed to cochlidinium blooms, even when you dilute that bloom water out. Uh, and the toxic principle is associated with the cells. If you put the fish in filtered bloom water with no cells, uh, they all live. But even reducing that cell density by 75% is still completely ichthyotoxic. And this organism makes something known as reactive oxygen species, um, which everybody's probably familiar with hydrogen peroxide, which is one of the hydrogen peroxide, one of the reactive oxygen species. There's several others as well. Um, and this leads to really, these are highly reactive compounds that react almost with any uh, organic matter, including fish gills. And so this is what a normal fish gill looks like. This is what that gill looks like after exposure to cochlidinium uh, with the fusion of the gill lamellae together or the just destruction of them. Um, and this organism is um, just to show some research we've done previously, actually in the peconic estuary, some of it at least, looking at nitrogen uptake, where we found that the organism is pretty um, flexible in its ability to use nitrogen. So specifically, and some tributary areas, and again, this actually highlights what we were just talking about. Um, in tributaries where we know the concentrations of things like nitrate are quite high, the organism is taking up mostly nitrate and nitrite as its nitrate source, whereas in the open water sites where there's actually low levels of nitrate, it's relying on organic nitrogen. 
Um, so again, that not only is the water quality different, but the this rust tide organism seems to uh, fluctuate in its behavior depending on whether it's blooming in a tributary or in the open waters. So for this project, um, we're specifically looking at the temporal dynamics of nutrients and HABs in five bloom-prone regions of the Peconic Estuary. We're looking at the ability of nitrogen and phosphorus to intensify these HABs, and then also trying to hone in on the nutrient reductions that would be need needed to lessen the intensity of these HABs. And you can see these are our five study sites. So um, in the town of East Hampton, where we have uh, Three Mile Harbor. Um, and well, I think this site is almost probably right on the border of East Hampton and South Hampton. Uh, and that's being Sag Harbor Cove, uh, Reeves Bay, town of South Hampton, um, Meeting House Creek, town of Riverhead, and then town of South Hole, we have uh, Jockey Creek. And um, yeah, and as you as you've already heard, the three these three sites are all closed now due to uh, PSP. Um, but essentially, what we're doing is time series sampling, and uh, you know there's a bloom for all seasons. So Alexandrium is a spring phenomenon. Dinophysis usually goes from spring into summer. Cochlidium is usually summer into fall. Um, so essentially, we're sampling from spring um, into fall with some slight modifications of our approach, depending on which hab we're targeting. And at each site, we're measuring inorganic nitrogen and phosphorus, organic nitrogen and phosphorus, and also silicate to put the data in perspective. Um, we're looking at total phytoplankton biomass and then also the cell densities of all the different hab's. And then we're doing some experiments. Um, one type is pretty straightforward. I kind of showed it already where we collect water and amend it with nitrogen or phosphorus or both compounds. Uh, and then for the dilution approach, we had uh, the approach we used last year was uh, across the board addition, 75% uh, dilution of the water. Um, and just to explain this a little bit, and this actually should also show 75%, so a little typo there, but um, our control in this case is taking the water from the site and mixing 25% of the whole water with 75% of filtered seawater. Or you can also call it, um, so I guess that's backwards there, but filtered seawater, filtered site water. Um, and the idea being that the nutrients within the water are still there. So you're taking out the cells, but the dissolved nutrients are still there. We're contrasting that with 25% um, of the site water and 75% of what we call artificial seawater. So this is made with artificial salts uh, and therefore has no nitrogen and no phosphorus. And then to affirm that reductions uh, are due to the, the removal of nitrogen and phosphorus, last year at least we did addbacks of both the nitrogen and the phosphorus in both compounds, again, at the same dilution level. Um, and having the control diluted is very, very important because when you dilute seawater, you're actually changing the uh, food web microbial food web dynamics just a bit. Um, so for this year, we're doing the same enrichment experiments, but we have a slightly modified dilution approach where we're actually doing um, everything from 25% uh, uh, dilution to 25% dilution, 50% dilution, and 75% dilution. Uh, and at the 50% level, we're adding back the nitrogen and phosphorus just as a check. Um, and then I'm just going to show some other data from a few other points we did last summer where we did the same thing, but then also after doing the nitrogen phosphorus additions, examined oxygen consumption in dark bottles um, from the same incubated water to assess how these um, nutrients might be affecting, affecting oxygen consumption. Okay. So moving on to data, uh, last year, this is data from the five sites um, and densities of Alexandrium. And essentially what it shows is like right out of the gate, we had a very dense bloom of Alexandrium in a plate in Jockey Creek. Um, decent levels in Sag Harbor Cove, but really not much to speak of in the other locations. Um, I hold out the possibility that we, you know, we only got, Joyce can attest to the paperwork and the agreement going uh, really in May, so we may have missed the peak of the bloom, although as a 
colder winter, it's hard to know. But this this would suggest that at least for Jockey Creek, we may have. Um, because this is the sort of data set that we really like to get that shows a before, uh, during, and after of harmful algal bloom, or what we call the initiation, peak, and demise. Uh, and so this is for dinophysis. You can see the time shift now is May going into June. Um, and for this for this particular hab, what we saw are, are really dense blooms occurring again in Jockey Creek and Meeting House Creek. Um, and then the next one, next densest was uh, Sag Harbor Cove, uh, and not much to speak of uh, by comparison to uh, the other the other sites. Uh, and I'll note that this is uh, a pretty 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 high level, so 170,000 cells per liter. Um, it's not record setting, but it's the highest we've seen um, in New York in a while. And then finally, cochlidinium being a later in the season bloom um, and super sporadic. So you, what you can see here is it seemed to form blooms in July and then sort of went away and then came back uh, in the uh, in September. So kind of an odd pattern and um, it's a hard bloom to track. If you look at this aerial photograph here, you can see it's pretty, uh, it's not a homogenous bloom. And so you can, you can be fooled, even though you're sampling the same site, it may well be that this say this big patch rolls in one day and is just off from this, your sampling site uh, the next week. Um, and you can see it was pretty consistent in many locations um, for some locations and sporadic for others. Okay, so on to some experiments. Um, have many, many results that would take a really long time to present. So I'm just going to show some highlights. Uh, I think I've got results in each site, but not all different experiments. So this is showing Sag Harbor Cove and just showing our spring experiments. Um, and you can see everything is color coded here. And we've got uh, multiple experiments over multiple dates going from May into June. But you know, the results are in some ways a little boring because they're always the same. And that is, uh, this is evaluating the total amount of phytoplankton biomass. Uh, we get a boost from nitrogen and sometimes a bigger boost or oftentimes almost an equivalent boost from nitrogen and phosphorus together. Statistically, when we run something like a two-way ANOVA on this, because of the fact that the phosphorus alone is doing nothing um, this tells us that nitrogen is the primary factor in driving the trends here. And if we look at Three Mile Harbor, um, this is a different data set, but it looks awfully similar. So again, a very strong effect of nitrogen. Um, and you can see where things are, you know, you compare these peaks here to both the blue, where the water was when it started, and, and the red, where it was where nothing was added, and you can see it really is a dramatic effect. Um, and as a bonus, just to show uh, just a few other experiments we did on the East End, uh, most of these are repeat sites, but not entirely. Um, and just to show you pretty consistent in some other locations like uh, Little Peconic Bay, uh, Peconic River, and you can see the, the, the increases in some case are enormous. And beyond that, we also saw that that same water has a significantly higher oxygen consumption rate as well. And so this is important because it tells us not only are the nutrients or the nitrogen driving the algal biomass, but it's also driving hypoxia. Okay. And then sticking on the enrichment experiments, uh, just showing some highlights. We caught a bit, but not much, Alexander, in 2022, but uh, we've got 10 of these experiments in already this year. But from 2022 for Alexandrium, uh, our SAG Harbor Cove experiment uh, in May showed that we could lead to cause a 2.5 fold increase in Alexandrium with the addition of nitrogen. Um, and what's amazing here is that when we collected the water, there was hardly any Alexandrium in the water. So it was taking off on its own, um, but you could supercharge that takeoff by adding additional nitrogen. Um, this is data from Three Mile Harbor experiments, three different experiments in three consecutive weeks in uh, June when dinophysis was in bloom. And if you look at the trends here um, in each of the experiments, the comparing the nitrogen addition to the control, in all three cases, we got significantly higher levels of dinophysis 
uh, with addition of nitrogen. Now to move on to some of the dilution experiments. Um, so going to show this first set from um, Reeves Bay. This is looking at the total community. First experiment didn't get much. And this second one probably looks like not much. It's probably partly because of the scale. I'm going to show a third experiment where it really blows the scale. But what we see here in this experiment, not too far from the other ones, is that we get an effect from, in this case, nitrogen and phosphorus together. But actually, if you compare the control with the, uh, the dilution of the nutrients, we get a 40% reduction in phytoplankton biomass by diluting out those nutrients. Uh, and the uh, end of May experiment, same location, same trend, but just exacerbated. So actually, again, statistically significant increase from the nitrogen and phosphorus. Uh, and again, this biomass level statistically is it's a 40% reduction um, by diluting out the nutrients, just showing that it does work. Um, and then looking at some of the specific harmful algal blooms in this particular experiment in uh, Three Mile Harbor, uh, again, a similar result where we add the nutrients, we get more dinophysis, but if we dilute them out, in this case, we got a 30% decline uh, in the amount of biomass. And then here at Jockey Creek experiment from uh, June of, of last year, and in this case, again, with dinophysis, um, again, slight increase with more nutrients, but a very clear, in this case, 2.3-fold decrease and the biomass and actually cell density of um, dinophysis with that dilution of nutrients. So concluding, um, looks like I'm out of order here, so I'll put them all up and just go through them. Um, Alexandrium, dinophysis, and coccolidium continue to form harmful algorithms across the Peconic estuary. I said 2023 is record setting with regards to acreage of shellfish bed closures and number of shellfish bed closures in the Peconic estuary. Um, and that says something because the first shellfish bed closure was, uh, I think, in 2006. So it's, um, you know, and th therefore, in more than 15 years, we've got the most, the worst year yet uh, for PSP in the Peconic estuary. Uh, I showed that nitrogen has a consistent simulatory effect on algal biomass. Um, and that harmful algal blooms are promoted by excessive nitrogen. Um, and that, um, well, looks like I have some leftovers here from another <laughs> conclusion that I didn't get to finish. So I'll just end it there um, and simply say that I guess the other conclusions would be diluting the nutrients made the have less intense. And we're in the midst of our second season here with a more complex nutrient dilution approach, uh, which will give some refined answers and happy to take any questions. We have a question, uh, Chris, you raise your hand, Chris Club. Yeah, hey Chris, thanks for doing that. So your, I'm just trying to read the simple headline here, right? So like a 25% reduction yielded a 40% reduction in, in algal biomass. Depends on the experiment. So, you know, we're really still like in the midst of, of um, I wouldn't want to put that as the concluding tagline yet since we're in yeah. year two. But what we're, you know, the reductions are leading to, are making the densities lower and therefore making the halves less intense. Right. Right. So I think, you know, I, I want to reserve, I want to have more data before we get, you know, yeah. too fine scale there. Well, I, I think what I'm trying to get at is is to how you back calculate what the true load reduction to avoid future HABs would be in a, in a particular water body. So, right? yeah, it, I mean, is it 25, 50? You know, I, I mean, I know you know through the sub watershed plans, a lot of our our creeks and throughout the island are requiring a 70 to 90 percent load reduction. Yeah, and uh, I think. If this could put a finer point on that, that would be really, you know. Really yeah, I think either a finer point or it just would be supporting evidence that, you know, but I, you know, I, particularly this year's experiments, again, we just finished 10 ex of these dilution experiments with Alexandrium, you know, for all the different locations. And I think, and this year we have a finer 
Um, you know, instead of having one dilution level, we're doing three. I think that's going to give us, um, uh, you know, finer scale, more granular uh, sense of, of how nutrient reductions will translate to, to have mitigation. All right. Any other questions for Chris? Hi. Um. I don't. I don't know how to raise my hand, but um. <laughs> <laughs> Speak up. <laughs> um. So, hi, Chris. Um. Hey. <laughs> so, I think the dilution gets at this question somewhat, but um, like, is there any, like how how do you simulate like you know the differences between flushing times between these locations? Um, you know, it's like the physical, um, you know, seawater exchange that that happens in in the real world. Yeah, I mean that's that you could add that in uh, as a complexity to the experiment. We're not doing that. We have done that in the past. Um, you know, you could and you could do that in different ways. You could have you can mimic the amount of tidal exchange, um, and then with that you could decide, well, or maybe what if you exchanged in clean water as opposed to, you know, the water that's right. going to have the background nutrients. So, um, but you could also, so you could do that experimentally, or I think you could also model that into the results. So that is, um, you know, as you saw in some of the experiments, the biomass just went, got super high. Yeah. Right? So right. you could, you could, you could take that data and apply a tidal flushing Okay, amount yeah. and sort of correct that data. So, okay. I, yeah. so yeah, tidal exchange not considered here, but could be considered both on the experimental front. We have done that before, uh, or sort of on as a as a modeling approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions or comments from the audience? All right, then. Thank you very much, Chris. Such a great yeah. presentation. And let's move on to the next one, which is me again. <laughs> so I'm going to be presenting on our tracking tool uh, as part of our CCMP 2020 goals. We wanted to create an easy to use tool that anyone can access and track how well are we doing on completing our CCMP goals. Um, we partner with the Geospatial Institute of Stony Brook University in creating this tool. And instead of just showing you a bunch of slides, I'm actually gonna go to the tool, have it open already, there we go. So this portal is live. If you click on the link that I just clicked, it will take you here. Uh, we have a few, and nice photos here. Uh, this portal basically starts with our four main goals of the CCMP. If you hover over these goals, you can see how many objectives, actions, and projects we have in each of these goals, and then the percentage completion. And right? so obviously the plan is at some point to make it to 100%, although there are some uh, projects that are never going to be completed. For example, one of the projects is the annual water quality report, right? So this gets done every year. So it's never going to be ended because at least for now, there's no end of time. So we click on one of the goals and right? it takes you to this page where you can see here these pie charts that shows you how are we doing towards uh, completion of actions and completion of projects. You can hover over these pie slices and it's gonna give you numbers. And then right, you can drop down here and it shows you how this action specifically is looking and each right action or project with which each project within the action, it's color coded by a level of completion, right? Uh, you can do this for all of the actions and see how things are looking. <clears throat> As I said, we can go back to 
any of our goals. And again, you're gonna get the objectives, right? the actions and within the actions, the projects. Uh, this is not everything. We are really aiming to having, let me minimize this so I can see what I'm doing, uh, having a way to share everything and make it you know, easily accessible. So for example, let's go to the one, water quality. We can go into explore further into objective D and that way when we open it, there's an option here, right? We will see the projects again, right? For example, this is the one that is not gonna be completely done because we renew it every year. But here you can link, we can link, right? Actual reports and data for quick access. We are still in the process of populating these related sources. So, you know, in the near future, you should be seeing a lot of more stuff getting added. So it is going to be a good way for us to share everything we do, all the reports, all the data we collect, all the maps, all the figures, everything with anybody that has right a need or an interest to go and look. Uh, not only that, but this tool also lets you access the data hub. Again, we are in the process of populating this, but this tool has really good mapping capabilities. So for example, if we go to this one, right? You can check uh, here. If you click on this, it will take you to the uh, source. But if you click on this one, first one, you can just look at it. Let me see, come on, there we go. With the tool viewer. And whoop. You see, that one is showing you outfalls in the Peconic estuary. You can download the source data. You can right, zoom in. You're interested in a specific location. Uh, you can pick up the point, and I think, there we go. It will give you specific data on that point. Right, so pretty neat uh, mapping capabilities. That, as I, again, the point is right, being able to share data. Um, we are, as I said, in the process of populating this. This one is also pretty neat, right? So these are habitat restoration projects, right? If we click on this one, those are projects completed since 2000, uh, 2000 right? Again, we can zoom in and for example, look at this one. Now it's gonna give you a description of the project, what was done, right? maintaining, maintenance, information, the cost, when we started, when was it completed, contact information, more info and links. So this tool is, I think, a great way that we came up with uh, to not only keep us in check, how are we doing, how are we progressing towards completion of our goals, but also, a gateway to share data and right, especially for local governments or towns or smaller water quality groups, you have need of getting something, you can just come here and hopefully you will find it, be able to find it. Um, I think that's, as I said, this is live. So just click on this link. I will share these uh, slides or the links uh, with the group, but if you click, on this link, you will be able to, you know, go and play with it. And that's basically what I have to report on this tracking tool. I don't know, if Joyce, if you would like to add anything else to what I just said. Yeah, the, the only thing I'm gonna add, and thank you for that, Sarah, is that we are working on the back end to input all of the information and projects that we're doing. Um, and that this is, um, really to gauge how we're doing against the conservation management plan. But, you know, we encourage you to, there are pieces of it that will be added, right? As things are highlighted and things that we want to highlight, and it will link to other things. One of the things we're doing in the next year is the development of um, a more comprehensive water quality tool 
Um, it's building off of something, Chris, that you started, you know, with that app. Um, but on the back end, trying to get everybody's data and classifying it by things that um, have a quality assurance plan, which is something, you know, we have to do for certain funding types or, um, you know, what's citizen science data, like maybe the Blue Water Task Force, so that people who access it can understand how they can use it and have confidence for different things in the data. Um, and we know we have a lot of partners that collect data for different reasons. Some of it might be a one or two year project. Um, and that's the limitation of it. You know, it's not going to go farther than that. But sort of a clearinghouse of all of that information, we're consistently asked for this. Um, and so that will link into the, this tracking system also. Um, and so some of this is, you know, not maybe completely relevant to the Water Quality Collaborative, but certainly looking at, you know, us using it to assess priorities, like what else does this group maybe need to uh, work on potentially recommending for changes in what we're doing? Thank you, Joyce. Uh, do you have any questions? Any questions from the audience, comments? Yeah, I, I just want to note that, uh, you know, Joyce, I know you're doing this kind of, we're also interested, obviously, in a data management um, system. Uh, you may know that Save the Sound is doing something very similar. Um, they're developing their own platform for data management and presentation. Um, and they're, they're actually going to be showing it on Tuesday at our um, Subwatersheds Wastewater Plan uh, Monitoring Plan uh, group meeting. Um, so is this part of the unified water study? Yeah, you know, I, do you know what I, know, I think so. I mean, I, initially they started it as a sound only uh, thing, um, but DEC is uh, we're going to be funding is going to be funding additionally so that we could use it for the entire island. Um, so and it, I've seen a little bit of it so far, and it looks pretty good. I mean they. You know, you can or they can uh, you can upload all the data to, to their system. I mean, it's not live yet, but um, I've seen like I guess a demo of it, and uh, you can upload all the data to their system and then see it visually and then query it and make reports. Seems very similar. So, to, uh, to yeah, I, I think my follow on to that is going to be I think that tool is also requiring that everything be put into WQX. Is that right? Is that what it's called? The federal. Yeah, yeah. Water quality exchange platform, which none of the data the county has to date can be put in there the way it is. That was always an ongoing problem between uh, PEP and um, county data, not to say it can't get there. Yeah. Um, but so, yeah, I, I'm absolutely willing to have that conversation. Um, but, you know, this is something that we started moving into place. Um, you know, and this is what happens when there is duplication of effort and people don't talk to each other, which, you know, we have 100 committees and trying to rectify. But, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, certainly looking, that's that's fine. Um, I know that they were doing something. The Unified Water Study is a citizen science based program, too, um, which is a little bit different. So, um I look forward to the meeting and we can talk about how things align for sure. Yeah, sounds good. I, um, as far as the WQ, uh, the, you know, the EPA's database, um, they, they have some way to interface with it to push the data between WQX or, um, but I, I'm not exactly sure how that works, but the, apparently this platform is, uh, they're trying to, to arrange it so that, that, that it, could, uh, it could push your data to WQX for you. Well, that is a new development because we've had this conversation at least 25 times in five years. So I look forward to seeing what that is and how we can use it. Sounds good. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from the audience? All right, so then it's time to move to our next presentation. This is going to be a presentation on the nitrogen load reduction cost assessment tool that Pep uh, created in uh, collaboration with uh, the Anchor QA of 
they created for us, we're gonna say it, and Beth is going to present on this. And let me stop sharing. And the floor is yours, Beth. You are muted, Beth. Hi, thank you, sorry. Just swapping it. Um, okay, so uh, we're gonna provide an overview of the um, nitrogen load reduction cost assessment that we uh, worked with the kind of to um, develop. Um, the objective was to uh, provide a tool that could support um, nitrogen load reductions for the Peconicus for PEP and stakeholders. Um, and the approach was to assess the cost per pound of, um, of nitrogen reductions for a list of BMPs that um, we, um, that we work through um, with, with, uh, with PEP and their stakeholders. Uh, so I'm just gonna go over briefly up uh, go over the approach and then um, introduce you to the BMPs that um, that we generated um, cost per pounds for. Um, and then if there's uh, detailed questions, we could navigate over to the pending um, website that, um, that provides more details. Uh, so the, uh, the VMP list was developed um, initially through um, the information uh, PEP provided in the um, RFP, um, and then through uh, Suffolk County's Reclaim Our Watershed, New York State Center for Water Technology, and then um, Cape Cod and Chesapeake Bay have um, very advanced programs that have identified um, BMPs and load reductions. So we definitely, um, use their information, as well as um, information from the literature and um, just uh, our, our knowledge about, um, or our expertise and experience with, with these BMPs. Um, and then this draft list went through an extensive um, review process, and um, then we got a final list of approved BMPs. And these were, these are the categories, um, the specific BMPs, um, uh, fall under, so included septic waste, both approved and experimental. Um, exp we'll, we'll, we'll go over those, <laughs> what they are. Um, and then um, surface runoff, uh, so um, uh, BMPs that capture stormwater, basically. Um, ground, uh, groundwater, like things like PRBs, and um, then also uh, BMPs that can promote, promote nitrogen reduction in uh, for for agricultural areas, uh, as well as turf grass, um, there's there's recommend there's specific uh, recommendations that Linap um, developed that we just uh, costed out and water re reuse. So so when you um, you know when when th this is really geared towards um, uh, like systems that are are already being planned, like um, sewage treatment plants that can that they can be tapped um, to to um, use the effluent for irrigation, like for golf courses, and then also bio extraction, which is not directly comparable to to the other ones because um, it's not really uh, reducing the um, load to groundwater, but it's you know it's in situ practice that um, is definitely important. Um, so uh, for each of the approved list of BMPs, um, we identified the advantages and disadvantages um, and, um, and, and the considerations that would, um, that in, in addition to cost that might affect the decision-making for um, implementation. And then the, um, the details for treatment. Um, so basically the approach um, 
to that we use to estimate the nitrogen load reduction levels. And this is all based on information from you know, the literature, um, the sources um, that we use to, um, to characterize the, the VMPs. Um, and then uh, we determine the cost per pound of nitrogen uh, removal. And the costs include construction, um, O&M costs, and, um, and they're annualized over the, the BMP lifespan, which was 20 years in most cases, but, um, but things like, you know, like a forest buffer, you know, that has a much longer lifespan. Somebody have a question? There's a uh, comment in the chat, Thanks. Uh, yeah, um, so. Oh, can, th don't worry about that. Okay. Oops. Okay. Okay, so um, so the first category, septic waste BMPs include approved systems, uh, systems that are approved by Suffolk County, um, the IAOWTS systems that um, are, I'm sure everybody on this call is familiar with. <laughs> um, and then, um, and also for individual level and as an and cluster, um, as well as sewering. So just, you know, um, what, what an actual um, sewer treatment plant would, would cost and the, the benefit. Um, and then experimental systems, um, which I think um, NRBs still fall under, but I don't know, Chris might have an update on that. I, this is, you know, it's been a while since <laughs> I worked on this project, but, um, but one, one of the uh, NRBs got pro provisionally approved for general use uh, this week. Oh, wow. Congratulations. <laughs> okay. So we can bump it, but um, the NRB up like at least one up into the approved yeah. category. Um, and I'm sure everybody's familiar with those, but yeah, um, you know they're they're um, passive uh, compared to um, A I I A O W T S, which which are more active systems. Um, and there's there's three types um, with varying levels of uh, treatment. And then also uh, constructed wetlands, which um, really need to be used uh, and be combined with another treatment method, but um, but um, there, there actually is one on Long Island um, in uh, for the Nature Conservancy has has installed. Well, I, I, actually, there was one at the time that we developed this. There might be more, um, you know, that um, that enhances the nitrogen removal um, from uh, wastewater. Uh, so. Um, so this is just an example of what um, what the you know the website uh, the information that's on the uh, website and uh, I'm not going to go through all of this but again if somebody has questions we can navigate over to there but um, but you know all the information that um, I described before um, you can uh, navigate there it's it's organized under category and then for each BMP. Um, you can uh, navigate through uh, the information to get the details. Um, so the next category, uh, so surface runoff BMPs, they, they include wetlands and wet ponds. And the, this is the, the, the wetlands here are, are distinct from um, the wetlands that you would, wetlands that you would use for, for wastewater treatment, um, but they're designed to, uh, to uh, the wetlands are designed to um, treat stormwater runoff, and the difference between wetlands and wet ponds is wetlands um, the the uh, the drainage is routed to um, the wet pond, and it, and the um, drainage the effluent might be routed as well. Um, and then rain gardens and bioretention systems. The main difference between um, rain the between the two BMPs uh, is uh, size really. So rain gardens are generally smaller than large bioretention systems. And these are just vegetated shallow depressions that um, capture and treat stormwater. And one thing I think um, important to note about um, rain gardens is that there's a wide variety of um, nitrogen removal um, rates depending on um, the, de the um, design. So uh, design is very important. Um, 
infiltration basins, these are the things you see uh, along the road or like by malls, you know, they're more like uh, standard um, stormwater management systems, but they also have a nitrogen um, reduction benefit. Um, then for groundwater, um, PRBs, um, they're trenches with, with a, um, lateral trenches with a, a, a carbon substrate that uh, promote denitrification. Um, and they are uh, more permeable than the surrounding um, uh, soils. So, so it promote, it, it sort of attracts the groundwater uh, to flow through these systems. Uh, then, the agricultural BMPs, um, these first um, three um, practices are designed to capture uh, the, the agricultural runoff and treat it to some extent, um, include uh, wetlands, um, you know, either conservation, um, wetland con conservation or like restoring um, a, wet a wetland that might have been functional um, at one point. Uh, on the on the uh, farm, uh, and then forest and grass buffers, um, and denitri denitrifying bioreactors, which are similar to an NRB, uh, but they're they're at an edge of field and um, and they're you know require um, drainage installation of drainage systems like tile drainage drainage uh, throughout the um, throughout the uh, where the plants are. <laughs> um, and then the, uh, the, the nitrogen reduction practices, these are designed to reduce the nitrogen before it runs off. So um, just reducing the amount of nitrogen that's, that's needed and used on the, um, for, uh, for growing crops. So um, they include nitrogen re uh, management plan, which is uh, a very site specific uh, plan that um, is, is designed to uh, incorporate practices that reduce nitrogen uh, nutrient runoff. I mean, among other, other things, but, but that's you know, one of the uh, benefits. And there's a whole slew of practices that are available. Um, so they're the, um, typically um, uh, like an expert will work with, with their farm to develop a plan that um, is the right fit for, for the farm. Um, and then some of the practices include cover crops and soil health uh, enhancement, which has a number of um, options to promote soil health, which uh, can lead to um, reduction of um, the amount of nitrogen you, you need to use. Um, turf grass recommendations, um, these were provided by LINAP um, to balance um, uh, Long Island's love of healthy lawns with, um, with the need to reduce um, nitrogen loads. Um, and the, this was really um, done by, the, the, the benefit was estimated by um, compare, calculating the cost of um, the cost and the load of um, standard fertilizer, the nitrogen uh, load from standard fertilizer and, and its cost to the, um, the, the recommendations, the LINAP net recommendations. Um, I just included the cost per pound here to um, just um, means of a comparison with the, with the next practice, which is um, water reuse. Um, it tends to be a lot more expensive, but again, it's not the main, um, you know, it, you, wouldn't, um, you wouldn't develop these systems. Well, actually, for groundwater, you may, but but for um, for a uh, sewage treatment plant um, reuse of uh, using the effluent from um, sewage treatment plant for ir irrigation, you probably you know do that um, combined with you know the need to reuse water or the, the you know the uh, benefit from uh, reducing water. Um, so um, you know so this tends to be a, a lot more expensive, but basically. It you know you would capture the effluent from it from um, sewage treatment plant, or you can um, install a well in like a area of that where there's like a nitrogen um, hotspot, groundwater hotspot, and and pump that water 
um, into like a golf course or some other um, open space area that you'd want to irrigate and then um, and then you know basically treat the water from from the irrigation so you get some uh, and then you re you're also reducing the amount of um, fertilizer that you would need to add to the um, the lawns. And then the last one um, we looked at was bioextraction. Um, I think everybody here is familiar with, um, you know, that bioextraction is uh, seaweed or shellfish that can promote um, removal of, of nutrients and um, just general health of the uh, of the water body. Um, so um, we are. We, we have a report on the shelf and um, and also a, and an online dissemination pool, tool on the shelf. And we're just working through um, some final stakeholder comments. And um, I think um, that should be, uh, both, both should be available soon, but I'll leave that up to Joyce to uh, provide a better estimate. Um, but, but the, so all the information that's in the report will also be available on the website, is, is available on the website. It's just uh, not live yet. Um, and also there's a, um, there's a map that um, you can uh, identify what BMPs are available for each parcel within the watershed. And, um, and and then and and look at the load reductions for for each of those BMPs, uh, so that so that you can compare and um, hopefully make some decisions about which ones you want to implement. Um, so any questions, we can navigate over the website or. Uh, so Beth, while we wait for questions, why don't you show us the website? Okay. I think we have all good on time. So. And thank you. <laughs> okay. All right. So you know the landing page um, just has um, the uh, the categories, and then you can um, click over to um, get the information that's uh, that's. Um, common to all the different types in each category. And then, um, then, you, then you can find the specific information for, um, for each specific BMP and provides the advantages, disadvantages, all the um, considerations that um, need to be taken into account, uh, funding, a uh, permitting funding, and um, then how the, um, how the load reductions were calculated, um, the load reductions, and then the cost per pound. Do you want me to keep clicking through or? Oh, I guess I could show the map. Mute it, <laughs> that would be great, thank you. <laughs> so it, while Beth does that, does anybody have any questions, comments, suggestions? Anything? No? Then let's let's go to the map and then maybe somebody will have something to say. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I'll just add that uh, the report that goes along with this and this tool, um, some of you on this call, you know, the county, the state provided comments um, I mean, maybe a year and a half ago at this point on this, I, most of you have seen some version of this already. Um, it was delayed largely because of staff capacity um, over the past year. So, uh, you know, if you feel like you want to review the document again, uh, please just let us know. But we have had, um, you know, this had the document itself has been uh, substantially reviewed, but people have not seen the web tool. So we're really looking for if you have any comments about this web tool. Um, it is not live yet. Um, I'm not quite sure how to give people access. 
best to look at it, but um, you know, it, if there's anything you think that would be beneficial, reach out and we can go through it with you together maybe um, and look at it. Um, okay, so um, you can just, you know, click on the parcel to see which BMPs are available um, and get just get some information about the parcel. And, um, and then also, I forgot to mention that, um, you, you know, um, one of, I guess one of the considerations is whether you're in a, um, in a gr groundwater priority zone. So that, you know, definitely like, um, would, if you're making decisions about which areas to uh, implement, um, those probably are the priority. And the, so you can get the depth to groundwater and, um, and whether where you are um, in terms of priority, um, and then and then all the information about um, cost per pound reduction is also available. Um, I think I'm taxing the um, taxing my computer resources right now, so not everything is showing up. Um, um, yeah, so I get. Um, I only, I think I mostly heard what you said, Joyce. I was trying, I was trying to navigate, but I, I think, I mean, so this, this is a pretty simple tool. Um, it was a pretty, um, you know, limited project, but um, you know, we are definitely interested in making it um, have more functionality. And I think um, we're talking, in talking to, um, to uh, Pecanic History Partnership about uh, potential funding for making it a little more site specific and a little more um, a little more functionality for the for the tool. Thank you, Beth. Um, so I, well, Beth, I just real quick, I think that there's like immediate utility for this tool, mm -hmm. uh, partic particularly for those of us who might be involved in the CPF water quality advisory programs as uh, applicants come in. Um, and then we could go to the, the, the project site that they're proposing and see how that, uh, that proposed uh, intervention aligns with this tool. Uh, so, I, you know, I, I definitely see, you know, instant utility in this um, as you know, not everyone on those committees is well versed with either the landscape or the mm -hmm. tools, or both the landscape and the tools, right? So I think it's, um, you know, I think the challenge for you guys is just going to be keeping this up to date, right? So yeah. uh, you you briefly flashed the IA technology tables that were that were mm -hmm. up there, and it didn't reflect the current numbers out of the right, code, yeah. Right? So. Um, you know, just I think that stuff like that is going to be a never-ending challenge if it's to be a living resource where, mm -hmm. where tools and things get updated, or is it uh, you know more static and you know updated once every two, three, five years? So, Chris, I think the answer to that is the idea was that we would um, have a disclaimer on the website and update it annually as part of our. Um, EPA reporting. So when we do EPA reporting, we pull in all the information from the county of installed systems in the watershed and all of the towns, um, both for IA and for land acquisitions. So at the end of every year around September time, we, we compile that data anyway. Um, yeah. You know, and we are working with the Geospatial Center and a long-term relationship where, you know, they can kind of field some of that input for us, but we would be able to have, we have to get that data anyway. Okay. Right? Yeah. It just, it just seems answer. like a labor intensive to do every year, but if, right. if you yeah. have, if you have to do it and then you have the geospatial center with the technical skills to be able to uh, integrate it, that's, that's phenomenal. If you could be able to pull that off every year. That's the dream. I hear you. Yeah. Well, if, if you know, and and we we can do that. Like we, you know, we have a we have the calculations set up so that they could be updated. Um, it's you know, it's just a um, that would be like the next step to make that um, something that's functional on the website. Yeah. 
So Beth, I'll, I'll ask a question. If I was navigating the the website, I'd maybe have a better sense. But so is this? You said it's part. Is it parcel specific? You said. Yes. Yes. So yeah. So and that's a that's another potential next step. I mean, we you know, um, like if you go to um, Cape Cod's website, which kind of it's kind of it's very clunky, but um, it does give you the ability to like combine, like identify areas that you would want to implement load reductions and then combine the load the load reductions for, um, you know that. The, those different parcels, um, or and it's not necessarily just parts. You know, could be you know just uh, an area that you want to. Uh, the parcel doesn't necessarily need to be like a tax map parcel, it right, be, right? You could define yeah. the. You area. can define the space without relying on parcels, but yeah, that's what. And I mean, wouldn't you? I would just guess. First, I maybe before I guess talk about maybe a limitation that just say this is like amazing i've never seen anything like this in my life <laughs> so just the idea to potentially have that is awesome but i mean it's getting down to like the individual parcel i i, I just presume in the finer scale you get geographically the more broad assumptions you're making because you may not have all the details necessarily for a site, like if you're going to, for example, do an IA installation on a given site, you'd want to do like a geological assessment, engineering report, right. and flow yeah. and everything. So certainly there's trade-offs probably on the, I, I guess it would be the more granular you get, the more assumptions you're making. Um, yeah, yeah. Does that sound right? Yeah, yeah. So you're not going to actually know the cost until you implement, you know, because because of the reasons you just described. Um, but this gives you an, a, a means of evaluating, um, comparing widely different BMPs. Yeah. So that, um, yeah, yeah. you know, like, like you, you know, as, you know, that the, the um, just uh, implementing the LINAP nitrogen, the fertilizer recommendations is pretty inexpensive. Um, and, uh, you know, especially when you compare it to um, the water reuse, you know, so, it's just right there. It it shows you that where you're going to get the most bang for, or the um, the um, a big benefit at a very yeah. low low cost. And there's a lot of lawns in the watershed. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So that's you, you actually just referenced why I like that this whole project got started. That I totally like. It's been so long. That I think so many people forgot was like. Uh, you know, in the, you know, in the early days of, you know, say 13, 14 years ago, thinking about load reductions was looking at Cape Cod's MVP tool mm -hmm. and how we could import and, and trying to import that here onto Long Island. And at the time, we didn't even have watershed maps, right? We, we didn't even mm -hmm. have the basic data to start a water MVP tool. <laughs> so the fact that we've come this far uh, is, is really just phenomenal. Uh, you know, another great tool that we have to be able to uh, make better decisions uh, or explain to people the importance of making those, those decisions. Um, and, and so I'll just add to that. This started out really besides just emulating what they did in Cape Cod. Um, but for some of the smaller villages and towns to be able to sort of make decisions. And then as we were having this conversation, I mean, God, we must have started this in what, Beth, 2019? <laughs> it was a long time yeah. ago. Yeah. Um, it, you know, the sub watershed plan was kind of just finishing and getting final. And so building in that parcel level data as a response to all this new information that we now had. Um, and that's why we're talking about like launching this kind of as is with some disclaimers on it, um, let people talk about it and get used to it while we kind of in the background work to what are the best updates to it. So, I mean, if kind of this group can articulate or think about what these updates are, um, that over the next year we could add to enhance this, that would be really helpful too.
And we will also caveat it with, um, and I don't, I don't think you touched on this, but the agricultural BMP portion of this is in no way an comprehensive agricultural BMP review. We ran into um, some challenges with trying to articulate this better. So we've kept it very limited to an example of, I think there's three in there for agriculture um, with a recommendation in the report that somebody who does ag work should probably explore something like this for agricultural practices. But this is not, this is meant to just touch on, we recognize this is needed in agriculture. Also, here's some examples, but that's not the focus of this. All right, <clears throat> are there any other comments or questions? So I think that takes us to just new business, open floor, if anybody wants to, you know, suggest any topics for the next meeting, anything that you would like us to discuss, look into it, now's the time. Mm, all right. Looks like everybody's ready to start <laughs> the weekend. <laughs> so I would like to thank you again for joining. And Chris and Beth, thank you for your time and effort in presenting at this meeting. I really appreciate it. And we'll talk again, I guess, towards the end of the year for the Water Quality Collaborative. Remember, the TAC meeting is coming up in May. Let me open my calendar. We are scheduled for May 18th. So most of us are also usually attending those meetings. So I see you all there. And I know, Joyce, anything you would like to end at before we end, we finish, we say goodbye. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. And I will uh, record this. Yeah. So I will send you, once the video is processed, I will send a link. Uh, Chris, you wanted to say I would something? I if, if, uh... Sarah, if you and Joyce could stay on just for a half a second, there were just a couple of, it'd be just easier if we could just chat for a minute than, than, yes. than a thousand and one emails. <laughs> yeah, I think most of our mine. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. All right. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thank you. You can probably stop recording. <laughs> yes, I'm on it. Okay. Let me find the right.